think are, um, this is um, selected from an article written by a couple of folks at ProPublica on the use of automated risk assessments for criminal um, and predictive policing purposes. So these are tools that you know, police officers can use to show it, to, to shine light on an individual and will come up with a risk score on a, on a scale of one to 10 with regards to their likelihood of committing some crime and their likelihood of recidivism. And what they found in doing the research was that um, this guy on the left, Berger Parker, is black and his risk was 10. And the guy on the right, Dylan Fugit, was white and his risk was three. And the data eventually showed that, you know, uh, the, the poor black fellow had no subsequent offenses, uh, but was, was uh, indicated to have such a high risk because of his affiliation with his race and class. Yes. Uh, you say, what was the name of this thing? It's called North Point, is the name of the tool that was used. Yeah, and it's, there's an article by ProPublica. If you just put in like criminal risk assessment, ProPublica, you'll see it. Thompson Barr opined that they like gave the green light to use these kind of tools because there was some pushback as to whether or not this is it, it's it, it makes sense to use them in the criminal justice context. And I have a student in my law school course that's writing about this. And for us, the sort of key issue is that criminal jurisprudence is supposed to be focused on the individual. You're just, like so as to not have biases. Like you're really supposed to consider the facts in their uniqueness. And these tools are general by nature. Um, so you know, how can we they might give some insights that could support judgment. Um, so then it's definitely a question of how the individual policeman or judge or whatever the user of the system sort of filters through whatever bias might be introduced so as to maintain the judgment. Um, so this very brief thing on sort of some of the ethical issues that creep up in machine learning algorithms. So um quote statement, these are some fellows from E College in um, so supervised learning algorithm, I always think about it, if we have an equation where have x times y, x times w equals y. In supervised learning, um, we know what x is and we know what y is. We're trying to figure out what those parameters of w are so that we can get it so that x is equal to y. Right? So our learning processes are going to reiterate, we're going to make a bunch of educated guesses until we converge at the point where we get the right thing to get that outcome in our equation. And if the y's and x's that we have are on past data that include social biases, whom we should admit to our incoming classes at Eaton College. And it is a bunch of people that look like that. Um, in all likelihood, in the future, we're probably, the system's going to go out and look for characteristics that are similar to what we saw in the past. And it's like, a, it's like, it's like an affirmative action, right? It's a likelihood to sort of perpetuate some of those, um, some of those past uh, tendencies. Today, well, can we introduce blindness? Um, so like the I think it was orchestras in the United Kingdom in the 80s or so. They found that there weren't enough females in the orchestra, so they were like, what if we put a curtain there for all of our auditions? And it worked. And they got a woman men, and the women became professional violinists and violists. So we say, all right, can we replicate that process in algorithms? And uh, for reasons we don't have time to discuss today, the math um, doesn't support itself that well. It's hard to just sort of homer people similarly, as Cynthia Dwork from Microsoft said. So what we have to do is treat dissimilar people dissimilarly, right? So they're like, you have to sort of, you know, accept that the prejudices are there and try to do something to address them. But it goes through regressing on characteristics which are correlated. That's right, yeah. So there can be these embedded, they call them redundant embeddings, where let's say we're doing, we're trying, we don't want race to be a part of our loan decision. So we say, we, we'll, we'll keep zip code in. We want zebra apps to be a part of it, but think about your mm -hmm. contract, think about options, right, um, et cetera. So even when we treat dissimilar people dissimilarly, the system warns hard from learning with Google. Um, it's tough from a statistical perspective because if, let's say this is your minority group and this is your majority group, uh, your algorithms will, will fit well. You've got a really strong sample set and they do a bad job fitting to you know, smaller, a smaller sample set. So, um, so if we were to do some sort of targeted advertising campaign, you know, uh, this guy, these guys would get nice personalized stuff and here would be a better So it's it's just, just another slide to show that to do this stuff well in practice, it creeps up all over the place. Um, this is Trump with 3D Dream. Uh, so 
this gets even harder in fact when our interpretive discussion kind of interpretability where we're not even sure which we do for the where it creeps up in terms of the language stuff. So um, there were studies by, I can't remember where both Lofty is, but um, uh, Ward and Benny stuff that I talked about where they went through and they did these plays where you can um, use the vector and put the difference between a couple of vectors to make analogies and words. So they show that in space that the same distance man lies here, uh, woman lies here, and then you map over and you find where king lies and then trace that same distance in space and it will end up needing to be equivalent for you know woman for and, and so so you know woman is to woman is to queen and king man is to king. My my head is a syntax a little off there. But you see what I mean, right? These two things lie in parallel spaces. Um so they push it and for us that that's an innocuous comparison because there's not many kings and queens in the world anymore. So you don't really heavy heated gender associations with those two terms. But if we push it into contemporary professions, it's not to the man is just here forever. And this is just the frequency with which these terms tend to occur in the training that the documenters train upon, as well as black males to assault it as white males to take over to. So um, if we build a chatbot that's trained on this corpus, uh, we will presumably not want it to perpetuate those kind of biases. Um, so they've done some cool work to solve that where uh, this is probably TC, which is a dimensionality reduction tool to work with uh, high dimensional data, where they put on the uh, X axis are just uh, just terms affiliated with different genders, and then you've got um, below, let's see here, no, here's, here's what they did. So it's, uh, the genders are, are, uh, are crossed over on the, on the other side of the Y axis. And then above the X lies um, words that are gender charged. So if we were to sort of call a woman sassy, breast, house, housemaker, et cetera, it would be a little kind of gender neutral. So um, you know, if we call a queen, a gal, a sister, it feels okay. Likewise for men, is um, anything that lies that lies below the X axis can stay. So it's cool. We're we're allowed to have that gender association. Anything above, they just reduce to down. And collapsed it to the mid-axis so that it wouldn't be there, therefore associated with gender in the models, which was a cool, you know, cool hack to get around the problem. Um, so yeah, so as I said throughout, for me, the sort of takeaway here uh, is for building up these kind of technologies differ. Um, AI to support legal activity or replace legal activity. I think we've seen that the answer is yes. That for a bit who wants us to think through that. And then, I mean, the other is, is and this is focused on professional responsibility. Um, most of the time, these tools aren't going to be built by operators and built by technologists. So, to what extent do technologists need to be aware of things like zealous advocacy? I think, I think there's increasing awareness of the, the social ethical issues that we've been discussing in the, in the domain, but few and far between are going to be those legal hackers that actually have written model rules for professional conduct. So it's sort of like, how do we, should these rules evolve, or what kind of training do technologists who are working on AI applications need to have that they can take question? Are, are you asking the same question, the same question like the guy working on the self-driving car, does he need to have a license? Is that what you're saying? Is that the same question? Hard. Imagine if you're a, a, an engineer at you know Uber or Google. It's like, do you need to have? Do you need to be an ethicist in order to build stuff? Like it's like, you know, you need an auto drive. Kind of do you need, like what if you've never driven a car? Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you need do you need an auto drive car to, to to design an algorithm? One thing that I can say in terms of tracking companies is, um, I was just with a bank and they're building out a chatbot to work with customer service data. No one on the tech team had ever taken customer service calls for us. They never talked to customers. And so we said to them, go do some design stuff. Talk to the sit for a day as a customer service person. And then you'll get a feel. You don't have to make these assumptions around like what seems like a friendly chat bot. You'll actually have first hand experience. I definitely think on that side, you know, um, and there we'll say, or you could partner up with a subject matter expert in the domain to sort of get a feel for how things work. I talked to somebody yesterday who was a 
as opposed to ended up, um, you know, we work, which is a co-working space. So the guy who's doing data science right now for pricing is quitting. And that's because he's a super smart physicist who knows nothing about pricing. Oh. He never read a marketing book. He never talked to the marketing people. And he can't solve the problem. So I think there's a lot of benefit to be had from collaboration with people who are doing this stuff as opposed to arrogantly. Um, I know we're, we're going to wrap up, but something that's interesting about the way the question was posed is um, you need to have a driver's license um, in order to work at Google and work on the algorithm. That's what I'm saying. And I understand so it's one of the highlights of it because um, it to me, one of the things that demonstrates and that I was kind of taking notes when we went through about is the, how much the context of the role in, how much the role in context matters. And so I would think, I don't really know how Google does this, but I would think you might want someone in Google to be kind of like a driver who has a license, perhaps, and someone in the role of passenger, someone in the role of mechanic, someone in the role of um, city planning and traffic. And so you've got all these different roles in your spec. So driver's license has a um, input to like the consultation of people on teams or experience that people are bringing to it. But I think it's important to kind of um, kind of grok where it's in constellations during design work. I'd say that I thought that was awesome. Um, and so I, I was able to get um, the last bit of it. And um, um, in the last week of January, um, we're going to have a legal intensive here on data and analytics, where I'm going to take some of your questions as inputs uh, to IEP, second annual. Um, data analytics, legal intensive, and blockchain. And um, I like the last few questions, the last few questions you were posing, and some of the tough conundrums there um, that, you, that you posed in the middle. We'll make that a starting point. So if anyone's interested in continuing the dialogue, um, you're welcome to take a course, uh, but also it will be online. So you can kind of like check in asynchronously and maintain the, uh, the conversation. Um, this really is the cutting edge. Uh, in the, it's well beyond, uh, I'd say, what the, the, the state of the art within the law and law practice, you know, uh, understanding the nature of the technologies that um, work with the human dynamics lab and what's at the forefront of the machine learning AI. I think I look over the horizon, so I really encourage you to keep grappling with this and um, kind of stay in the game and keep the dialogue going. So, you guys are welcome to join us if you're interested in any of these things. Um, reach out to me. <laughs> Let's take a moment for a couple of minutes. Do you have a profile?